have a hierarchy of information in our media. At the top, we have important news broadcasts, and way down at the bottom, we have grumpy cat memes. Now, this hierarchy helps us quickly and efficiently filter important from less important information. But it has a darker side, because the information that comes at the top of that ladder, we certainly we identify as truth. So that this image represents these people's reality. And this image represents these people's reality. Now, what that means is that when it comes to imagery in our media, these things frame our reality. What we can do is we have some mechanisms that help us analyze the validity of these images. But they only analyze what is shown, not what is left out. What we can do to interrogate this hierarchy further is to look at the images that come a little bit lower down on that ladder of importance. I work in that area of media that sits a little bit down, lower down on the ladder. For the past six years, my colleagues and I at What Took You So Long have been making video content for development aid organizations. Uh, we often work in the same places that these kind of images are taken. We, our content doesn't often reach the news, but we're in these exact same places, just taking slightly different images. So these were taken in Liberia, and these were taken in Somalia. Now, these images don't always reach the broadcast news, but things are changing. Journalists are having to more and more work with development aid organizations. The top of the ladder is meeting the middle of the ladder. Why is this happening? News agencies are increasingly underfunded. And journalists, when going to emergency situations, often have to rely on development organizations with their access to stories, local infrastructure, and local knowledge. And they don't particularly like this. This was written not by one disgruntled journalist, but by the London-based International Broadcasting Trust. It's no love letter to development. The disconnect between these two media players lies in the fact that they have very different perceptions of what makes an important story. If you can imagine a war-hardened correspondent and an advertising executive covering the same topic, the straight lines of their truth would not have a bridge. They would miss each other. But within this dysfunctional relationship, we can learn something that's very important. I'd like to explain further by telling you about two great thinkers thinking a century apart. In 1910, Lev Kuleshov, a Soviet filmmaker, created an editing experiment with film. He took this image of an expressionless actor, and he paired it with an image of death, an image of soup, and an image of a beautiful woman. He showed these pairings to separate audiences, and then he recorded their responses. The ones that saw this image of death believed the actor to be showing an the embodiment of a wistful sadness, or a desperate hunger, or a soulful lust. The simple pairing of these images caused the audiences to recognize this image as truth. They all saw the same face. Now, what this tells me about the state of our media is that we subconsciously recognize the images they show us as truth. So that this image is truth, and this image is truth, because it's in the news. But what about this image? And what about this? Is this valid? Is it a priority that you see this? In 2009, Chimananda Ngozi Adichie stood on the TED stage and spoke about the dangers of a single story. How the single story, or one side of the story, can reduce an entire continent to an object of our pity. Kuleshov and Adichie both recognized that telling one side of the story can be seen as the whole truth, when the rest of the other sides of the truth are left out. And the thing is, you won't even realize because you haven't seen it. Uh, in 2009, I was also working with The Positive News, which is a very small newspaper founded in my home county of Shropshire in the UK. 
Back then, I wanted to be a journalist, but I had a slight problem in the fact that I didn't really like the news. I found it repetitive and circular and often really depressing. But working with the positive news, I realized that there are ways to tell truths that are rooted in forward-moving change. What I did not understand was why this positive media was seen as alternative news, why it wasn't at all newsworthy, and why it had such a tiny readership. In 2009, I could see that the written word had itself really set, and that my ideas of serious, positive stories didn't fit in. And then I met the future colleagues that I would work with at What Took You So Long, and I learned about filmmaking. And one of the most interesting things about the moving image is that you have a choice. You can make something plain and ugly, or you can make it beautiful. And in making something beautiful, you have the chance to grab someone's attention, make them sit up and watch, even if the content isn't as shocking. Now, the only people really receptive to this idea of positive media six years ago were some grassroots nonprofits who were willing to do anything to get their message out to the world. So we experimented together. And within these experiments, we defined our own ethical boundaries. These guidelines were of beautiful cinematography, of only showing real positive stories, and of never selling poverty, misery, or sadness. Since that time, I have seen a huge shift in the media landscape. And many outlets, almost accidentally, seem to be embracing positive news. So one example here is Ariana Huffington, who on her Facebook page pretty much only posts positive articles from the Huffington Post. It seems that positive media is gaining traction as a valid currency. Now, for me, when I approach an NGO story, I find it an intellectual challenge to start not with the problem, to find another route to telling the story. To begin with, the problem seems to me to be a cop-out. I want to upend stereotypes, upend people's perceptions, and in this process, I want to grab audiences' attention. So now I'd like to show you a couple of clips put together from a video that we shot in Somalia. Mostly, as you see, I use MacBook, iPad, iPhone, Samsung, and Nokia. Solar technology can increase sustainability and the security. It's easy the technology. The only thing we need is sun. The sun is free. The Somalis are mostly an oral nation. They like to talk, they like to chat. Technology is really made for the Somali people, I think. <laughs> So, what did you know about Mogadishu, Somalia? I'm sure you've heard about Al-Shabaab. I'm sure you know about the bomb attacks. But have you had the opportunity to see daily life there? Have you seen people playing karate on Lido Beach? Girls playing basketball? Have you seen Somalis working in skilled positions? I know that you know that daily life exists there but you have to see it for it to become your truth. Now, so far from what I've said about journalism, you may get the impression that development aid organizations are all embracing positive media, but that is not the case. Many, many aid organizations are still capitalizing on poverty, misery, and sadness to elicit your pity and your outrage. I believe that this is short-sighted, and uncreative, and it adds to a generalized negative view of the world. And on that happy note, I would like to ask you a question. If presented with the exact same facts, would you be more likely to pay attention or even give to a charity that showed you sad images or one that showed you happy images? And if the answer is sad images, why? 
with presented with the exact same facts. Why? I don't believe this is human nature. I believe that we've been primed for this, and that the media and aid organizations playing into it are lazy. Now, if you were to tell me, rightly so, that journalists have a duty to tell us about the horrors of the world, I would absolutely agree. And then I would tell you about Katie Myler. Katie is the founder of More Than Me, a Liberian-based NGO that helps at-risk girls go through school. During the Ebola crisis, all their resources went into fighting the disease. She was there, and she saw the horrors. But what you see in Katie's social media feed is images like this, and this, and this. You see the joy and life of the girls that she works with. And this is what she wants you to react to. Not their misery and their need, but their life and their need. When I asked Katie to comment on what people thought about her unusual methods, she said, I can feel what people respond to. I post what's real and my kids aren't sad. During Ebola, I wasn't only posting happy pictures, but I mixed it with baby Kate pics as a contrast to show even though Ebola is horror, there is still plenty of life. This is baby Kate, and she's very cute. When I asked Katie whether people respond to sadness truth or joyful truth, she said they respond to authenticity. Katie's social media feed was providing balance in one of the most extreme situations. The images that feed your view of the world are defined currently by news organizations and more frequently by development aid organizations. And this view of the world is currently not a particularly pleasant one. Within, their, within though, their disconnect, within the bashing of heads of journalists and development aid organizations, we have an opportunity. There is a deconstruction of this hierarchy. And within that deconstruction, we have the opportunity to ask, what is an important story? What are the images that are important for us to see? to get a whole view of the world. In this confusion, positive media can gain some traction. Organizations like More Than Me can experiment with what we respond to, and even online sites like BuzzFeed, better known for its online viral cat videos, are now showing serious positive news content. But it still is up to us, as media consumers, to consider what information we have in our life. With the information and the images you show yourself, what's your picture of truth? What does it look like? I believe it's the responsibility of media makers to keep us aware of our choices and of that input. Because ultimately, the pictures that we see will frame our reality and how we react to the rest of the world. Thank you.